So I was wondering, Taylor, it's like, what's the definition of a podcast? As Because like what we're doing here, I kind of think it's in its own kind of unique category because it's not really a podcast. I don't, I mean, I think of a podcast as either one guy or like say the three of us sitting around a table generally in the same room and you say, and you just kind of go back and forth, you know, and just kind of spar or just sort of discuss or whatever, like the, um, uh, I think it's called the working tools pocket. There's mm-hmm. one out of, um, it's like British Columbia and Washington state. And, uh, the, and then there's a Masonic round table and all that. Those are more podcasts. This is similar to a lodge meeting in that, you know, I host, we don't open, of course, we don't do the ritual, but I bring in a speaker and we have Q and a, so I took that idea from the research lodge, but like, I love doing panel discussions here, which I guess are closer to being a podcast where it's like, I, I, I need to do another one, but I get like five or six guys to come in. Like, we did one on uh, traditional observance lodges a year or so ago that was awesome because I just picked people. I just was asking, you know, grabbing anyone's like, have you ever been involved with an observant lodge or anything? And I got like six, seven brothers to volunteer, and every single one of them had a different experience. One had only attended some. One, they converted their lodge into an observant lodge. Another one, they started one from scratch. And uh, so they all had a totally different perspective on it and it was just luck of the draw but that was great because i just do up some questions and kind of interview them but i love the forum here it's just sort of like i'm just making it up as i go along and it seems to work and it's i'm sure it's just totally off the top of my head i'm like hey that'd be cool i want to do it on this and i just go do it i yeah. have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> just make it up as I go along but it's hitting so it's like I'm, i must be doing it mostly right because you know, it works, but I don't know, it's kind of funny. This whole medium seems new to me, and I'm constantly questioning myself, like, okay, is it is it working? You know, can I do more? Can I bring in more people? Am I reaching a larger audience? You know, do I need to really work on expanding it? I don't know. It just seems like I'm never satisfied. It's really nice what we have, but I feel like I got to keep improving it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of yep. just rolling with it and not be like, okay, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the heart of it, right? Is it's learned by doing and uh, constantly adapt is just the way to do it. Um, yep. I like otherwise I like the Zoom meeting format. Yeah. yeah, me too. Okay. I mean, some some podcasts go into the uh, TV studio format, right? And that uh, that's kind of what I think people I think a podcast is. But you then you I mean? got you got the the travel ones where they've got a GoPro and they're on a sailboat or snowboarding or whatever. Yeah. or hiking or right oh yeah that's more of a video selfie kind of thing <laughs> you know? well i mean it can be whatever you want it's like we're, we're this is a whole new medium podcasts are a fairly new medium they call them vlogs but that never nah. stuck video lo- video vlogs yeah. i remember that word it, it died it didn't. well the you know if you're if you're traveling and want to and I want to let you know your friends know where you are and you've got the GoPro and that that type of thing. Yeah, that's a video log, but uh right. That's about it. Right. I think it's, it's funny. Um it, it's funny because with blogs, I have a website that I maintain, and that was the first one I did before I started doing any lodge ones. And there was all of these you could download, you know, or you could sign in to online blogs and, and show it on your page or whatever. It's like, no, screw that. I'm a program, I'm gonna make my own. So I sat down and made my own blog software, mainly just oh, to cool. see if I could do it. Like, okay. And it's basically just SharePoint, but I customized it enough that it was blog format because they didn't have anything that really did what I wanted. And I was like really into that and I was posting regularly. And then I got into Facebook and I got to where and Twitter and I was posting on that, that I stopped doing my own blog because I was, it was much easier just to go on to Facebook and see something so like. I wish I had kind of kept my own blog up along the way because it's much easier to search my own stuff because searching on social media is really hard. Even your own oh, site. Yeah. If you have a lot of content, especially like me, who's always posting something stupid, um, it's hard to find things. It'd be, it'd be nice if you could have like categories and things. If you could go into like Facebook and say, okay, I'll put this in the Masonic category and like pin it in some way. 
And then you can just go somewhere and say, pull up all of my posts for this category and have them right there and sort. I mean, I know you can do it with the, behind the code they have, but it's, it's sort of like, I don't know, never got the hang of that. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. Um, the the Highlodge Research has a, a document repository. Um, mm -hmm. We use Club Express for, for our, our website. Okay. Um, and it's the, the file structure there is a little weird. Um, uh -huh. But I was looking through the content itself, and it, it's uh, it's really interesting because it's a hodgepodge of like some guy had a bunch of scans of books that he threw up there, uh, hmm. or th that the lodge had. So there's like your standard stuff, right? Like like your um, masonry dissected, a couple of editions of those, and things like that. Um, and then some very short blurbs where somebody had like written something maybe for the Beacon, which is Ohio's Masonic right. magazine. There's like a little, so one file was just like a little, like three or four sentence uh, blur about, you know, some symbol or something uh, and some random files uh, from like, so, so there's three different papers on there on Martinism, nothing mm -hmm. on Rosicrucian or uh, Luke Cohen's or, you know, the right of strict observance, um, but a bunch of old, like early 1700s uh, Masonic books. Just the content itself is a little, a little sparse. I kind of want to go through and um, have a more coherent idea of what's on there and cultivate, curate really what we have yeah. on that page. Um, the only reason I, I realized that it was, it was uh, there, were, there were so many gaps in there is that I, I was trying to rip all the files off off the website for my own archive because um, some of the old websites I used to look to at when I was just joining Mason, the Masons are gone now. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, that stuff is lost. I remember the Sangam Sanctorum had some really cool stuff on there. Uh, that was just gone. Yeah, have you tried like the way back machine to bring it up? Uh, I did. I don't think, um, because the Sangam Sanctorum was, uh, like had private sections and none of that stuff was there. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Way back. The way back machine works, except if it's like, um, data driven like if it's ASP, like there's a database behind it storing the data it's not really there but it was if it's just straight up html it's still there because they say they basically captured the html pages but if there was like a database like if it was a sharepoint site it's not going to be there because if the website's gone the database behind it is gone you might have the front page that's like a kind of a screen grab of the html page at the moment but like you can't dig into anything. So Wayback is cool. It's just it doesn't have everything. But but you're right about that. Just how many people maintain that for the for the lodge of research? How many people are actually involved in maintaining it? Um, just our secretary, to be honest. That's it, see? <laughs> yeah. Like I'm the single point of failure for Virginia Research Lodge for our website. And the Grand Lodge has been trying for about three years to get something up and running that we could use. And they thought about using um, Grandview. Grandview is. Do you have Grandview? I don't know. Yeah. How. Uh, yeah. We got yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, it seems Grandview. to be catching on. Yeah, it seems to be catching on. It's a good for me for members. You know, for for tracking members, for tracking lodges, and for community. You know, what they're doing with it is useful, and it's centrally located, so you don't have to worry about me quitting masonry or dying or something. You know. Our, love, our website's gone if I'm not there maintaining it. The Grand Lodge will make sure they're paying to keep that thing going. But yep. it seems to be very useful, and secretaries can report through it, and people can pay dues, and you can do announcements. So it's for that, it's good. It's really not a document archive. And our IT team tried to – well, it's the, uh, the Committee on Masonic Education – was trying to make Grandview work for a data repository, and that didn't work at all. So I think you could do minutes, else. but that's about the yeah, extent of it. It's it's not really geared for like, you know, storing research papers and more, which yeah, is what they wanted. They told me for years, we're you need to start putting your stuff in our archive. And I keep telling them, when you build an archive, I'll be happy <laughs> to put stuff there. But literally, they told me it's like you, you know, the grandmaster. You have one year to get stuff in our archive. I said, okay, in a year, I'll check with you and see if they've built anything yet I can put stuff in. 
but it's kind of hard to comply if you haven't given me any word. Tulane University mm -hmm. uh, did away with the home drives for the for everybody mm -hmm. and have a big uh, account with Box.com. Yeah. And so when I went over there to do temp work for a couple of years, uh, I didn't. I wasn't allowed a university account, but I had to get a free account, which has like ten gig limit, something like that. Yeah. And um, and then they gave me permission into certain places to store, you know, to store documents. Right. So uh, that were um, department related. They had a kind of a department per permissions, and um, you know. Something like that would at least get it off your home, your uh, hard drive. Right, right. Because you can give other people permission into a, any a, any account. Yeah. Well, it's been my goal to move us from because I've been a SharePoint developer forever. So it's like, well, I know this, so I use it. Yeah, if you know SharePoint. Website. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I can do a lot with SharePoint, but I'm I'm working more in the cloud now, and I'm looking about setting up a cloud account for the Research Lodge and move everything there. I mean, like email. I found a, an email solution, which is good that one of the guys I know has a um, thing through Google where you use Google groups. It's it's not ideal, but at least somebody else is maintaining it. So I'm not worried about if I'm not there to maintain it. But I want to like, like the Grand Commandery in Virginia, um, they had an IT committee that basically built a whole cloud presence for a whole bunch of different things that they want to track for Grand Commandery. And it's good that it's it's in the cloud. So there's many more capabilities and i wanted to do that for the research lodge instead of trying to redesign the face of the website i have i want to just build something brand new build a better search tool you know there's a lot i wanted to do with it and kind of move in a new direction i just haven't uh haven't had time to play with it and my lovely co-host is not going to be here today so i'm having to let people in that's after nine. Good morning, Basem. Good morning, Mike. Did I say that right? I always put your names. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're fine. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good to be here. Where are you coming from? Montreal. Montreal. Okay. Mike is still signing in. Mike, how are you doing today? Mike's still looking for his microphone. Mike, turn on your mic, Mike. <laughs> As always, I never know how many people are going to participate. You know, you put it out on Facebook and people say... There we are. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Mike. You put on... Uh, let's see. Today, we have um, three going. So let's see. That's Taylor. Well, okay, Taylor's here. That's good because he's a speaker. And Omar <laughs> and me, I assume. So yeah, you you can. I, I learned you can't trust. I mean, I put it out on Facebook, but I really can't trust that for who's going to show. But um, unfortunately, and the reason I had to move it to nine, and let me go and do my formal. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Virginia Research Lodge uh, unstated meeting for August tenth. Um, we're meeting at nine o'clock this morning because um, I have a funeral to attend at 11. And uh, it was a good friend of mine, Eric Holloman, who's a member of a lodge in our area. He was the district educational officer when I was a uh, worship master about 12 years ago. And he was very active in the lodge and with the widows committee, did a lot of work, was all into Masonic education. And uh, he just passed away and they're having a memorial service. So I have to be there. So I move this to nine. So I'm going to ask Taylor to keep it under an hour, if you would. <laughs> so but yes. norm normally I would I would just kind of do more vamping back and forth, but I do want to make sure we have time. I don't want to rush you at all, but I, normally we could spend like 10, 15 minutes kind of here uh, chatting with everybody beforehand. So, but I want to go ahead and uh, wrap it up shortly after 10, if I can, just so I'm not running late for that thing. But I, I didn't want to cancel again because – both Taylor and Owen had to cancel and reschedule a couple of times in the last couple months. 
and Owen canceling me again at the last minute our last meeting. So I didn't want to push you again. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Oh, yeah, let me do the obligatory um, uh, notes here. Um, I have, I'm going to put in links in the chat if that would open. Um, here we have uh, our Facebook group. If you're not already a member of our group, please join our Research Lodge Facebook group. Uh, we have our papers there. Um, our Research Lodge website that I was just talking about um, that has all of our papers and some other interesting things. And then a link to our, um, our uh, YouTube um, channel for Unstated Meetings. It's the playlist on YouTube on my channel. And I just updated it. So we are current as of today. All of our unstated meetings are up on YouTube. I think we're pushing 60 uh, recordings up there, which is just awesome. So there's a lot of good content. Please check it out. And then my email, if you're not already on our mailing list and you're not on Facebook, there's my email. You can contact me to uh, get on our mailing list. So get all that out of the way. Taylor, I'm going to turn it over to you. Please uh, introduce yourself. You've spoken here before. And you can go and uh, are you going to be presenting anything today? Uh, yeah, yep. Okay. I have a share my screen. Yeah, let me go ahead and do that, and then I'll turn it over to you. All right, obligatory. Everybody see the presentation? Yep. Awesome. All right. Uh, so my name is Taylor Clinic. I am the current worship master of High Point Lodge 773 in Monroe, Ohio. I am a past master of the um, Ohio Lodge of Research and a uh, former region of the Royal Schofield Society. Um, today's presentation uh, is part of a system of Freemasonry lecture, uh, taking a uh, systems approach to looking at Freemasonry. Um, and today we're going to be talking about network and graph theory and its implications for Freemasonry. There we go. So network and pomegranate. Um, these are two key parts of the pillars of King Solomon's Temple, uh, denoting unity and plenty. Um, and it's important to understand that Freemasonry is a type of a social network. Um, and understanding how these networks, and particularly social networks, uh, function, uh, their weaknesses, their strengths, uh, and the way uh, and the shape of the network is really important to understanding the health and vitality of the fraternity. And this isn't something we typically talk about. Um, but when we do have a unified social network, you know, we tend to have a strong fraternity and stronger lodges, um, and thus pomegranates, the fruit, are plentiful. Um, and a graph theory of social networks uh, and networks in general also helps us kind of elucidate some of the more esoteric aspects of a ritual, but that's not something that we're going to actually talk about today. Um, but these more modern understandings of, of uh, the world and how it works do help us understand um, some of the things they talked about uh, in our rituals uh, in the old writings. Um, different language, different analysis set, but they're analogous and they kind of help us see things that we don't notice before. Oh, sorry, I think I skipped a slide here. And it kind of froze. There we go. So the basics of uh, network graphs, um, you have two co basic components. You have a node, or um, in some of the languages of different uh, systems, they call it a vertex, and a link, or an edge uh, in those other forms. Uh, nodes represent a unit of the system. Uh, for us, it could be individual members, lodges, grand lodges, et cetera. Um, and you know, computer networks, they are you know, machines, servers, uh, printers, things like that. Uh, service nodes uh, and links are the relationships to one another. Um, so you can have undirected networks where information can flow any direction. You can have directed networks where information flows only in, in one direction. Um, and that kind of changes the analysis that goes on. Um, the links can be quantized uh, and give quantitative uh, values uh, representing their strength or their weakness. Um, this will come into effect later. Um, and all of this can be done quantitatively through uh, uh, 
matrix is in matrix math. Um, so you can actually run analysis on, on these networks. Um, the next set of basic pieces of a, of a network um, are describing the relationships between the nodes and the links. Um, so you have paths, which are, you know, a sequence of non-repeated nodes between two connecting two nodes. Um, so if we look over here, uh, a path might be from 10 to one to two to three or 10 to two to three. Um, and a distance is the number of nodes in that path. So this is just, you know, one, two, this is one, two, three. And so you have, um, different path lengths and that's a good way to judge, um, what you call distance. Um, or even the um, diameter of a network is how many how many hops you have to take to go across the network. Um, each node has a degree, uh, and that's the number of links from a node to uh, a number of direct connections to another node. Uh, so, for instance, you see 10 over here as exactly one, two, three, four, five uh, different nodes connected to it directly, so it has a degree of five. Um, and that, and th those numbers are used for analysis in other parts. Uh, another important part of network graphs are clustering. So it's a measure of the degree to which a node and a graph tends to, to cluster together. So again, over here, you can see that we have two clusters over here, this group one and this group over here two. Um, and there's a bridging uh, connection right here, which we'll kind of talk about the importance of those in a little bit. Another important aspects of graphs are and network graphs are centrality. Uh, it's how central to the network is any particular node. There's different types of centrality and, and different ways to judge that. So there's between a centrality, which is um, it's a measure of how many short shortest paths go through a node. Basically, how many paths does this node sit between? Uh, so for instance, you can see that number two over here is part of a different number of paths and has a, a, a between this uh, metric associated with that. Um, the highest between this centrality uh, is actually going to be number five over here. Uh, most of the paths that go through this will give it the highest uh, between the centrality. You can see that going from anywhere on this side of the map over here has to go through five and three, um, but three has slightly less because you can go around it on this side of the map. Um, the next one is closeness. It's the measure of the average length of all the shortest paths from a node to all other nodes. Um, and if you look at this, um, again, three and five have the highest closeness. Um, well, you know, two over here to fairly the least. Um, and again, that has to do with the, the average length of all the shortest paths from one node to all the other nodes. So these are just ways to describe um, the, again, the centrality of the node within the network. The last measure is the eigenvector centrality. And this is a measure of how connected a node is to other highly connected nodes. Um, again, the highest one here is going to be number three, uh, followed by two and five. Um, because these nodes are the most connected over here, it's going to have the highest value. The idea is that... Uh, that number tells you how closely it's connected to other powerful nodes within that network. Um, yep, yeah, we'll keep going. Um, there are other ways to look at what players are key, what nodes are key here. And again, if you look at this bridge right here between three and five, if this was disconnected here, you'd have two isolated um, networks and they wouldn't be able to communicate. And so this bridge right here between three and five is really important to that, that network. There are different types and uh, phenomena that occur within different networks. Um, so one of the most important ones is the notion of the small world. Um, this describes networks that are both highly locally clustered and have very short path lengths compared to a random graph, uh, i.e. it's very connected. So random graphs are graphs that uh, the number of connections that are present are randomly assigned based on a probability. This is where uh, graph theory originally started. Um, when they're doing analysis, they would make random uh, connections and, and just see what properties existed there. Um, so it's very random here uh, compared to a regular graph where every node is connected to another 
set number of nodes, and here it is three. In the small world, what you see is that um, the network is somewhat regular, but you have these bridging connections here. Uh, so these help to reduce the path length. So um, this idea is most commonly seen in the six degrees of uh, Kevin Bacon. Uh, so if you ever play that game, it's, you know, how many actors does it take to get to, to Kevin Bacon? Um, or and it's usually connected through various movies. So they might have one person or two people who are really highly connected that can connect them uh, to that actor. Um, this is an important phenomenon in Freemasonry and that um, it really describes well the fact that in the Sonic world, you might not have a ton of members at your lodge or not. Uh, not everybody's really highly connected within the fraternity, but there are key people who are extremely uh, well connected and help bridge those gaps. Um, so that if you are out and about and you run into a guy in a lodge halfway across the street, state, you might recognize him. You guys probably have a, a connection between one or two people deep. Um, in Ohio, guys like Chad Kapinski, uh, Jim Hall, uh, they are very highly connected, well-known, and people uh, usually can make connections through them. And this helps us kind of keep the idea that our fraternity is well-connected uh, and strong. And it's important uh, because the strength of weak ties. So earlier we talked about how links could be uh, assigned uh, strengths, so weaker connections and stronger connections. Um, so an easy example is, is to understand uh, family. So, you know, brothers and sisters are probably going to be have stronger bonds than, say, uh, you know, somebody in their third or fourth uh, cousin removed. Um, and those bonds are really important, though. Uh, but there's resources that suggest that weak ties could actually be more advantageous uh, in politics or in seeking employment than the, the strong ties, um, because weak ties allow for an individual to reach a higher number of other individuals. So, if we're only looking at strong ties, uh, there's a limit. Most people have friends, roughly, uh, we can consider close, uh, between uh, two to five. Uh, you can see that over here in the connections, there's strong ties. But those people have other friends, uh, and your connection to them is, is quote, weaker, but it does allow you to reach a much wider network. Um, and this is actually really important for understanding uh, growth in the fraternity. Um, Weaker relationships play a vital role in helping us reach our goals and make meaningful progress, particularly in things uh, like networking and, and job searching. This idea really came up in uh, uh, in research that was looking at how people find jobs, and they found that you usually don't get it through a, a close connection, but uh, somebody who yeah, has quote the weaker ties. So, um, you know, your barber's friend has a job opening here from your barber, and that's how you get a job. Those weak ties are really what drive. Um, uh, job acquisition for people and same thing for things uh, like fraternity right the connections between lodge members can be seen as strong ties um and the connections between lodges or members from different lodges might be considered weak ties but it helps us transmit information uh, across our social network within the fraternity um but when we're particularly looking at generating uh, more membership we can see that um if we're only looking at strong ties and only people who are really close to already uh, we're going to have a very small network of people to pull, uh, pull on. Uh, this all has some implications later that we'll talk about. Another uh, phenomenon, uh, this is more recent research, is called the scale-free networks. Um, these are where the links between nodes follow a power law. Um, so some, most connections have very few, most nodes have very few connections, but some uh, connections are hubs and they have tons of connections, right? Um, and this is the, the hub and spoke model that you see uh, uh, airlines using. Um, you know, there's a few major hubs that the airlines have to, and most of the travel goes through those nodes. Um, and this kind of derives from preferential attachment uh, and, and a risk get richer scheme. So um, as a hub grows, the likelihood that more nodes connect to that hub increases. Um, if you don't have a lot of nodes, it's likely that you're going to not uh, have any more growth. And you can see this in lodges where uh, lodges that are doing really well will tend to keep gaining membership, whereas lodges who are struggling are going to see a decline. Um, and in understanding what drives preferential attachment is really important. Again, I think it has to do with the nature of our connections. Um, and there's all kinds of examples of, of scale-free networks, and it's important to understand network effects also. 
Um, so network effects um, are benefits or hazards associated with um, a network. So um, a lot of, uh, let me rephrase this. Um, the more nodes you add to a network, the more value that network has. The obvious example is, is telephones, right? One telephone is useless. Two telephones is kind of novelty. So we start adding three and four and five and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, telephones into the telephone uh, system. That telephones actually become very useful, right? You, they you like to call people and things like that. Uh, same thing with uh, computers. You know, the more computers you have on a network, the more value that network has. And this is actually really the truth behind a lot of the growth that we see uh, in, in the early tech sector where Facebook, uh, MySpace, uh, a lot of these companies, uh, Lyft, Uber, we're trying to get more people involved in it because it adds more value to the network for each additional node that you have. Um, there's some other effects too that are important to understand. Uh, networks can be resilient and robust, or they can be fragile. If we go back to that first slide, if you cut that link in between uh, the three and five node, you have two separate networks and networks can fall apart. And again, with the hub and spoke model, uh, if you take out one of the hubs over here in red, um, you can basically disassemble the network pretty quickly. Uh, this is a tactic that is used in counterterrorism and uh, terrorist networks um, that if you can take out the leadership or key players and key connecting uh, connectors that the, the network will fall apart. Now, one of the things about social networks is that uh, they tend to have a lot of self-organization, uh, which allows them to be very resilient. So when you take out you know, a terrorist leader, uh, there's often times somebody who can step up into that role um, because the network is self-organized uh, and adapts. Uh, Freemasonry should also adopt a similar model of self-adaptation, where if you remove a lodge, um, it, it shouldn't cause the whole system to come down. Um, but there's an argument to be made that we're becoming less self-organized, um, that we're creating less lodges, um, and that lodges are becoming more stagnant and more controlled in a hierarchy manner. Um, and when networks are in a hierarchy uh, like that, it allows their benefits to hierarchies, just like in the military, um, you have can you know command and control structures that are, are useful in their own aspects, um, but they don't have the same level of resiliency. So you know if a general is in charge of everything, uh, say like Russia and Ukraine, they had their generals on the front line and they get taken out. Um, a lot of people don't know what to do. The American military has taken a self organized approach where you have an objective and let the people kind of organize how they uh, kind of pursue it. Um, and so when we're looking at Freemasonry, but inevitably comes up as a problem of, of our membership. Um, so some of the questions that we can ask about network uh, theory and, and self-education Freemasonry are, you know, how does our individual membership members' social network uh, impact fraternity, right? Uh, if we are, as individual members, if we have a smaller social network, um, less weak ties, uh, probably gonna have less members to join, right? We can't take advantage of the, the power of weak ties. Um, it means we're probably not having access to a wider social network if we're spending all of our time at Masonic events and doing Masonic things with all other Masons, um, then our social network kind of outside of that lodge structure breaks down, withers, and, and starts stops growing as a whole. Um, one of the things that we've seen over the last few years is um, Grand Lodges and uh, the Northern Masonic jurisdiction uh, using ads to target people and setting websites like bfremason.org um, where people can kind of request to join the fraternity. So what does that do for us as fraternity? How does that impact our social network? Uh, we'll take a look at that on the second slide. Um, but also through network analysis, if we actually run computational models here, we can actually look at the real issues of retention and that's impact on um, some of the schemes that we might have as far as ads or uh, Ask would be one or one day classes and things like that. Um, if we gain new access to new parts of a social network, um, but we keep our retention low, these are questions that we can computate and we can actually see um, computationally what kind of models or, or what kind of effects it'll have on our membership, right? Um, and there are consequences for poor retention uh, and that it could potentially poison the well. Um, and understanding that there's the rich get richer scheme uh, kind of just within the world 
and systems. There's the inverse of that, you know, the poor get poor, right? That if we are failing um, to gain membership or to improve our retention, those numbers are going to likely continue to drive in a, in a vicious uh, circle downward. Uh, so it's getting into that, you know, virtuous cycle and, and with the retention numbers and pulling it back. But network theory allows us to take a um, computational approach to this. Um, we also look at things like um, resiliency and robustness that if we have a static hub, uh, what kind of impact does that have on our, our structure or when we close out, you know, key lodges or, or areas, uh, what happens? Um, I have not had a chance to um, run any of these models in a way that uh, is um, useful for a presentation like this. Um, there's a couple different networking uh, network software packages out there. Some create better uh, visuals than others, and a lot of them require a level of uh, coding that I just don't have currently that I'm working on. Um, we're going to take a look at the next slide. So here's an example of a lodge. Uh, this is the same graph with a few additional things on it from our first slide. Um, here you can see this might represent a family cluster. So you know, father, son, uh, his kids might join another lodge over here. This one would go over here. When we are performing things like ads uh, and things like that, um, one of the things that can happen is that we can get somebody who's completely outside of our network, say this node right here, um, or say this one over here. So we have a couple of different situations that can develop. One is that if the person comes to the lodge, has a terrible experience, isn't worth their time, they stop coming to lodge, right? We, we our attention number fails. Um, they might poison their whole social network out here, right? So it's not just losing one person, right? And, and wasting lodge's time, you lose an additional uh, nine people for a total of nine people quote loss in your potential ability for your lodge to grow. Um, the other flip side of that is that, you know, the guy joins, he loves it and he gets, you know, another, uh, you know, nine or 10 people to join, uh, here, which representing this as four, um, or he only has one person and through the power of weak size, you get another member over here and then the network continues to grow further out this way, or nobody else joins from him. And this is kind of what we see a lot is that somebody will join the lodge and for a number of various reasons, nobody else in their social circle is interested in, in joining, um, but the use of, of advertisement uh, allows us to take a um, to gain access to part of a social network that we don't have access to um, compared to the traditional method of where, you know, uh, you know, somebody over here knows this guy. And so they join and a couple of their friends for their out join too. Um, that's really all I have for today. Further research would actually be running the computational models uh, using this. Um, you know, COVID was a thing, and I think most of us probably have seen the um, the models where they would look at how uh, the contagion models where people would get sick and things like that. Basically, we'd be running that in, in the same exact manner, except that it would be uh, positive when somebody, uh, quote, gets infected with masonry rather than the inverse of, you know, getting disease. Um, but these are things that we should be looking at when we're looking at the fraternity and not making, you know, blind shots in the dark, not addressing our cause problems, which really come down to retention and a lack of resiliency within the fraternity. Um, and that for the most part, as a, as a system, we become pretty stagnant. Um, and that the fact that most of our lodges operate the same way, uh, have the same set of problems tells us that there's a systemic issue there uh, that should be addressed before we go out and look at trying to tap into parts of our social network that don't exist uh, for the most part, right? Because Every lodge is different, and some lodges who do have, uh, again, the richer, richer scheme uh, that are functioning very well and are getting membership through the traditional way, they're also a great place to introduce people to uh, from your, your prospects from um, Grandview and things like that, uh, or from Scottish Rite or your Grand Lodge uh, prospecting system. Uh, whereas lodges that are struggling kind of can poison the well uh, for the community and lead to their own destruction. There's only so many people in the a given area that are capable or willing to join a lodge. So for example, in Ohio, uh, there's about uh, just a little over 4 million men who are eligible to join the fraternity, meaning that they are uh, old enough, uh, 
they believe in a higher power. Um, the number gets smaller when you add in things like, you know, no felons, um, you know, and a willingness to actually join in time uh, and money um, and, and those sorts of factors. Those numbers start to dwindle, dwindle pretty quickly. Uh, and that's something that we can actually look at and computate. You know, this is our actual population of potential members. And we can actually run um, these computational models against that saying, you know, if our retention number stays around, I think, 6% in Ohio, um, I actually think it's actually higher. I think I think it's big. We call it the loss 30 if the numbers are correct. I think from one day classes, we can see that it's, um, I think, 6% retention um, and where they go on to actually become an officer in lodge or something like that. Um, you can use those numbers to run to see how quickly you're going to burn through your uh, total population of people willing to join the fraternity uh, as it stands. And that's something that we don't really look at uh, as a group is, you know, that, that run when we have. Um, sometimes we'll do it financially and some lodges will understand that, you know, we have uh, $9,000 left and we're spending $50,000 a year in our building. Like we can't last terribly long. Um, that runway, as far as our population goes, isn't something we look at. Um, and additionally, um, when we look at the resiliency of the lodge, um, Sorry, I got distracted there. Um, we actually started looking at the, the, the number of, of people who can join the fraternity. Um, and we're doing something like a one-day class. We might be burning through um, our available population quicker than we can plan. Um, and, and so, for example, there are companies like Amazon who are struggling to find workers in their warehouses because they know they're going to have a high churn rate. But there are a lot of people who are not going to last very long, uh, three, six months. And so, uh, you know, there's some areas where it's more rural and they just can't find new workers because they've already gone through the entire workforce and say that these people can't work here anymore for whatever reasons. Uh, this is a danger to the fraternity that we just aren't really looking at. Um, if you're interested in, in finding out more about network theory, uh, there are a couple of book suggestions and websites. Uh, the first one is linked. How everything is connected to everything else and what that means for business, science, and everyday life by Alberto Laszlo uh, Barassi. Barassi is a uh, prominent um, academic in this field and he's responsible for finding uh, things like uh, scale free networks and things like that. Uh, Complexity to Guided Support by uh, Melanie Mitchell. Um, this is kind of a guidebook to complexity thinking in general, which network and graph theory is a big part of. Uh, again, Complexity, the Emerging Science of the Edge of Order and Chaos by uh, uh, Michael Waldrop is another book like that where it introduces a lot of these core ideas. Uh, scale is a little bit more uh, directed towards uh, scaling up and, and loss of growth, innovation, sustainability. Um, and it's by Joffrey West. This is a good book to understand. Uh, in business, people talk about scaling up uh, and scaling, um, which has its own issues. Uh, you can read more about that blitz scaling where a lot of tech companies just try to scale as fast as they can. That creates its own set of issues and problems. And this is a good book to understand the loss of growth and things that impact our, our social networks and the fraternity. And lastly, if you want to learn more about complexity uh, and networks, uh, Complexity Explorer by the Santa Fe Institute is a great resource. There's a program that they uh, have free lessons on called uh, NetLogo, where you can actually run some of these computational models yourself. Uh, that's all I have for today. Um, do we have any questions? I'm going to go back to the gallery here for everybody. Uh, thank you, Tanner. I, I enjoyed that. You you definitely brought up some things. Uh, I kind of want to ask the question. So I realize you say you, you, you'd love to like crunch the numbers and you'd actually get more useful data specific to say your grand lodge, but like assuming you could do that and get real numbers to back up the ideas here, how do you in a practical way apply this sort of analysis in telling lodges what to do. What, what do you do with it? Does this mean like shutting down lodges or changing how we attract members? With, you know, if you could wave a wand and say, okay, I've got these numbers, here's what the Grand Lodge needs to do because of what I've figured out. So primary, uh, it should be those computations to be able to look at um, certain policies, uh, particularly regarding uh, how we, who we drive prospects to uh, cause of the Grand Lodge of Ohio, uh, we get information, we get prospects sent to us, um, through the Scottish right, uh, not a man in Mason campaign and stuff like that, uh, and from their website. So 
there's a lot of people coming in through that process. Mm -hmm. um, and two is whether or not we want to do one day classes, right? So yeah. I think, and I don't have the the numbers right in front of me. I think originally when we did it, we had like 6,000 people go through one day classes and went down to like four and three. And then there's a, there was a very sharp drop off in the number of people going through one day classes. Um, and it should be these, these analyses should be ways to guide our, our, our policies on whether or not we're going to do one day class, um, which regardless of whether it's an appropriate way to, to join uh, and there's issues around that, um, there might be unintended consequences that we're completely blind to and these, these hidden risks, right. And things we don't know about that. If, if we're running through, um, our, our again, our population of people who are eligible to join and want to join, uh, and we're failing them and delivering an equality Masonic experience, um, it's a big risk. So it's, it's trying to determine which lodges are one healthy, um, and to what policies we have that might, you know, provide, provide this larger risk. And ultimately, um, for what does this mean for lodges and how they should operate? It doesn't tell you a lot outside of the fact that one, for the most part, we should have our, we should get away from the lodge being the, the heart and soul of a person's entire social experience. Um, hmm. So I'm, I'm pretty sure most people in this room have probably joined, you know, at least two dependent bodies, right? If you're part of the Virginia Lodge Research, um, you're probably, uh, and you have your mother lodge here, at least in two lodges right there. Um, you know, in our area, there's um, a new high 12 club that's trying to come together. Uh, you know, we've got all kinds of Grotto Shrine, York Rite, Scottish Rite, multiple lodges. Uh, I think Marshall Brother Miller is even working on getting the Tulsa Series 11 in going in our area. Um, and that's outside of all, all of the different kind of uh, other Masonic groups, right? So Masonic Ham Radio Clubs, the uh, Western Shooting Clubs, the uh, uh, the Stamp Clutchers. There's all there's there's even the Order of the Beaver, the Masonic Reenactor Group, right? There's all of these Masonic groups out there that See? can eat up our time. And that there's that joke where if you've seen the guys, he has got his truck, he's got like seventy different emblems on it, right? It's right. Like, I haven't eaten dinner since like 1999. That's part of the problem is that if our social networks are confined to other masons, there's no space to grow, right? Become root bound. And so it's identifying that problem uh, to people. Okay. So you're saying basically that in order to attract more people into masonry, we who are, I assume everyone in this room is a strong, active, outgoing, popular mason. We all have good teeth and everybody loves us. So we aren't attracting people because we're just hanging out with other masons. We need to spend time in non-masonic circles to attract other people into our group. If we only hang out with other Masons, we're not bringing anyone new in. That kind of what you're um, saying. It, to, to an extent, yes. Okay. Um, that there is an opportunity cost to only going to Masonic events. Mm -hmm. um, and just understanding those, those, uh, those opportunity costs, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I, you know, friends who I haven't seen in like a month or two because I keep going to Masonic events or I'm trying to get stuff together for, you know, district party um, and all these things like, you know, it takes time away from mm -hmm. some of our other activities. Um, and it's really more the power of, again, uh, weak ties that our relationship to the community and our ability to be effective uh, in improving the lives of those around us, right? And that sense of charity that Masons was embody requires us to have those kind of weak ties. It doesn't necessarily mean that we should have weaker ties internally, um, but we do need to kind of cultivate uh, our relationship with people outside of us in that truly Masonic sense. Um, and again, it comes back to focusing always on what Masonry is about and what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and that and I think at least following those kind of approaches typically results in a healthier social network for everybody and the fraternity. Um, and again, th this is part of a series of ideas uh, about, you know, Freemasonry as a system uh, that all kind of feed back into each other that we should be looking to um, develop Masonically and reintroduce some of the Masonic principles and ideas that have, have gotten weakened over time due to the way our administrative burden has shifted in the fraternity. Um, and those consequences that we don't really always think about or understand terribly well. Um, 
they have impacts we don't always see. Um, and, and potentially even using some like network analysis might help us understand uh, some of those costs. Um, Brother Dean mentioned uh, Tim Weedland. It's past grandmaster. I assume that's from Ohio. Yep. He messaged me. I think he meant to message the whole group. So I'll ask you. <laughs> Are you familiar with Brother Weedland? What is he doing to in this circle? Um, so most special Brother Weedland uh, during his years grandmaster. Um, during his rollout, he he had some numbers. Uh, the numbers were a little. Uh, a little hard for me to interpret. Uh, the way that he just graphed them um, was a little just odd from like a data analysis perspective. Um, but his, his whole point was that we need to make new members uh, and that essentially the one day class is, is an effective way to do that. And that if our fraternity operates more like a business and looks at our membership as, as customers uh, and things about things in markets, we'll be better off as fraternity. Um, I disagree with that for a number of reasons, uh, primarily that a lot of these companies that are uh, a lot of them, the more modern marketing approaches are really more about kind of cultivating what we actually have already, uh, which is um, kind of brand identity and identifying with their brand. Um, so um, think of companies like Lululemon and stuff like that and Apple, uh, you know, they have a, a target audience, uh, Stanley Cups. Yeti, uh, these brands have cultural identifiers that people use that kind of uh, that are kind of become part of their identity, right? Um, so, you know, the active lifestyle, athleisure stuff with Lululemon and those clothing brands, it's very popular because people um, want to present themselves as, as being athletic and, and active and fit. Uh, there are other companies who do the same thing uh, and have these kind of cult followings with with uh, with their marketing and Freemasonry, a lot of stuff that they're doing and things spend a lot of money and time and hard work doing has inherently in the way our, our fraternity is supposed to work. Um, and the problem isn't that we don't operate like a business. It's that we don't operate like our fraternity anymore. Uh, and that's some of the business practices, right? Uh, like our, our audits in Ohio, we have inspections. They're basically auditing your ritual and your, your paperwork, right? making sure nobody's stealing money, you're talking the right stuff, you're capable of putting on the degrees, have taken a, a real large prominent role in design culture. So inspections are people go there, they're, they're big social events for the lodge. Uh, people get really worked up. It's, it's kind of the key point in a lot of people's years master. Hmm. Not really what Freemasonry is supposed to be. Um, and lodges that are healthy, that's not really the case. And lodges that are, are bringing people in uh, that are functioning well, um, they're like, yeah, it's just another degree. It's not a big deal. We can do it, right? They tend to have a lot more fun at their inspections and have a lot more um, engagement afterwards. So uh, the parking lot lodge where everybody goes out and talks afterward, those lodges tend to have that inherently. And an inspection is just another way to get that uh, time in. Interesting. Um, I want to ask a question, uh, Taylor, because in, in Virginia, we have what I'll call like um, weak pockets, weak areas within the state. So, like, if you know Virginia at all, I'm in Tidewater, which is, you know, Virginia Beach. I'm down in the southeast corner. My area of Hampton Roads, Tidewater, is probably one of the strongest in the state. We have a, we're fairly close to each other, and we have Scottish Rite that's very strong. We have Royal Arch Commandery, Shrine, and, like, 20 Blue Lodges on the south side. Um, we're very active in masonry, and a lot of us know each other. That, that network and your talk about, I thought of several people that you, you mentioned the the strong um what you call strong it? ties and weak ties no 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 the, the, where the individual person knows a whole lot of other people oh hubs hubs yeah yeah i, yeah. I think i know several people are hub. i think i consider myself a hub because i'm active on social media and all this but you, you go somewhere and you see what you see the the at least some people everywhere you go that are at everything mm -hmm. and you're right they make the connections well anyway this area and Richmond and Northern Virginia is where most of masonry operates. And then there's other big pockets, but it's like, if you go west of the, um, the mountains, I know they're hills, but they call it, like to call them mountains here. Um, in the west, far west part of the state, you have huge areas where you might have 20, 30, 50 miles or more between lodges. And most of those lodges struggle and they don't really have 
because they're kind of off the beaten path, the lodges kind of struggle and they kind of go on for years. Whereas here, it's like I could join at least 20 lodges that are within half an hour of my home easily and attend. And if my lodge folded tomorrow, I could easily join another one right next door. So I'm asking, in Ohio, are there like areas where basically there's not a lot of Masonic activity or you pretty much evenly spread throughout the whole state? Oh, no, we definitely have Hot Pockets. Uh, so Mike and I are, are from one. It's um, Cincinnati area, Dayton, uh, the Toledo, Cleveland, and Columbus area typically um, are, are the hot hot areas. Youngstown and um, Sandusky, Ohio are also you know, pretty strong. Um, so it's, it's, it's our eastern side tends to be um, more Appalachians, tends to be a little bit on the weaker side. Okay. Um, and... I think there are a couple of factors that go into that. Um, one, we have this idea um, that I don't think is is as accurate as that lodges are supposed to be a certain size um, membership wise. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Ohio, well, you what is that ideal size? Anybody ever yeah. tell you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and so I think sometimes we get hard on ourselves because there's this idea that uh, you, you shouldn't recycle past masters. Uh, you know, you should go through the line one step one year at a time you know um I, I don't think that i understand why that's the case and, and a lodge that's really active it makes sense to keep the um people engaged i do think we yeah. burn through our leadership though when we do something like that uh you know yep imagine your company having a new ceo every every year is probably not a good sign right, right. um <laughs> that the but most people, of that is that but most people don't join a company expecting to be a senior vice president or the CEO. They accept that I'm going to be a worker bee. But yeah, in masonry, these days, the assumption is everyone gets to be a master, which kind of means it's like, well, everyone gets to do it. Is it really an honor if literally, you know, this is our lodge, the six of us. Taylor just was initiated this year. I'm the master. Alan's the senior warden. Jason's the junior warden. Okay, Taylor, you're going you're gonna to be junior deacon this next year, and you're going to follow Paul. And you're going to be master in six years or five years. Um, it's automatic. Is it an honor if you have a pulse and we're going to make you worship master and within five years you're joining? Does it mean anything? Do you even take it seriously? It's like, oh, well, that I got my three degrees and the next step is junior deacon and I got to learn this. That's just the natural thing what everyone has to do. I mean, it kind of is kind of counterproductive in a way because it's like, there's no great honor to be master if you're a lodge, if you're so small and we run everybody through. Everyone gets to do it. It's just something I got to sit there. I don't even have to work at it. I, I get to be, you know, you could think I get to be junior deacon without even earning it. Why should I put any effort? Okay, I'll go learn that part, I guess, to sit in the chair, but I'm not going to put anything into it because they're going to advance me no matter what I do. You know what I mean? I think, it's almost like a government yeah. job. I get promoted whether I can do it or not. And <laughs> that's the thing is that we're not selecting intentionally for stuff. Uh, and a lot of stuff in, in, in masonry has become just perfunctory, right? Like this is just the form that you follow, right? You just go get in the line, go through the chairs. Yep. Then people don't know what to do afterward because there's not a lot of content or meaning behind doing it that way. Mm -hmm. The other side is that like, because I work with a lot of technical people, right? A lot of scientists and they, as a group, hate being managers, right? Nobody wants to be a manager. Uh, and so when you, <laughs> when you tell them that, no, you have to be a manager, you have to manage these people, like they're not ha happy about that. They're, they get right. stressed out about that, you know? And so we are putting people in positions that they don't really necessarily want to do. They're not qualified to do, uh, and they don't want to do and stresses them out. And this is why we have retention problems, right? And it becomes again, one of those, uh, vicious uh, circles where you know, now people hop out of line and you have to scramble, uh, and it's harder to plan. It's harder to put on good events. Because you have the wrong people doing the wrong stuff. And, you know, they get burned out. They get tired because nobody else is putting the work. And it just burns everybody out. Um, just as a model, it just doesn't work terribly well. Anybody, I, I want to make sure I open up the floor. Does anybody else have questions or comments about presentation today? I, I can always come up with stuff, but I want to make sure everybody else here gets a chance to comment. Right, is, is Mike Miller from your lodge or from your area? Do you... Uh, yeah, he's, uh, um, his lodge is like five miles from my lodge. Okay, cool. Work with all right. him all the time. 
Well, Mike, Mike, you're fairly new to me, but I think I've seen you before. I've probably seen you on Facebook or something. You want to say hi to everybody and maybe make a comment since you seem kind of new to the group? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so Mike Miller, I'm a past master of Jefferson Lodge in Middletown, Ohio. Okay. Um, also, uh, the senior warden for the Ohio Lodge of Research. So I've done a couple oh. of the uh, podcasts with David Dougherty. So if uh, you've no seen my face, that's probably where it's from. I do okay. get around and travel quite a bit. Um, you yeah, know, Dave, Dave's you a Ohio. regular attendee here. He's a good guy. Yes. He's going to be a speaker here one day. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I agree with a lot of what Taylor said. Uh, actually, a lot of this has been a lot of our uh, parking lot conversations <laughs> over the years. Right. Um, you know, you guys look, have done a, a really good job with this presentation today. Um, and one of the things, too, you know, uh, you guys were kind of talking about the uh, progressive line, so to say. Um, I've got a little bit of a different perspective of that. You know, sometimes I think pushing guys into positions that they don't necessarily intend to be on kind of helps them with growth. If it's done in a right manner, um, maybe not always easy with a smaller lodge versus a bigger lodge. Um, kind of like Taylor was saying, you know, there he's, his lodge is a little bit of a smaller lodge. Um, our lodge, when I first joined my lodge, we had roughly 500 guys, but I was also one of those guys who got plugged right in at Senior Deacon, too, without knowing all the, the details of what it was I needed to do and needed to learn. Um, a lot of my learning was on the fly. And I have to, let me, if I can interrupt you there, is like, I understand if, if your lodge is lucky to bring in like one or two new members a year and you only have about 10, 20 active members and most of those are past masters, you really have no choice. We got to put Taylor in line. We don't have anybody. In a lodge with 500 members, how many active members would you say you had at the time you were you were put in as senior deacon? We would have an uh, average attendance between 30 and 40. Okay. And so how come you got picked ahead of all those other people? Um, I think a lot of it was because of returning my work long form tradition, in a traditional manner. Okay. okay, so you did stand um, out a bit. Okay. Um, you know, but at the same time though, I was kind of like you guys had mentioned, I was very overwhelmed, um, finding yeah. out that, you know, inspection was a thing, um, that I could travel to other lodges that I had more ritual work to learn. And right. so at that time I had a three-year-old and my wife was pregnant with twins. So my. It was kind of one of those, I don't know that I want to continue <laughs> and be junior warden, right. um, but everything that I read before I had joined, which not everybody also does their research was that the number one way to watch your lodge die is to sit on the sidelines or not even come to lodge. So That's I said, true. well, I'll go to junior warden. And, you know, I looked at the lines. I'm like, okay, there's not much more to learn. And then of course, after I, you know, got put in the chair, then they're like, well, you need to learn a lecture. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, well, after I did a lecture, well, there's not anything else that I can't do memorization wise. Cause the lecture is probably the longest thing. So, but, I found growth in doing things that didn't make me comfortable. Um, but to do that to someone else who maybe didn't have that same perspective. Yeah. You, he could have been like, okay, well I'm done with this. This isn't organized. I'm not doing this. And then you ruin that whole social network group that he has outside of the lodge potentially as members. Right. So. And to piggyback what you're saying. Um, and, and I don't know if it came as clear through this presentation uh, as I, I usually hope is that um, the way that we approach Freemasonry kind of as as a whole for a long time was very form right this is what you should be doing you know um, there should be a progressive line um, Freemasonry is stronger when it's self-organized by that I mean uh, like the relationships and complex dynamic systems every person is an independent actor and they kind of adjust to each other and when you allow that to happen, just like in the market, it, it tends to have uh, more strength and be more resilient and robust. Um, and that really we should be allowing people to have that level of organization where they organize it themselves. So like it isn't that there's anything inherently wrong with a, a one day class or a uh, the way that we do inspections or with um, rest of lines or anything like that. It's that when we as individual lodges operate perfunctorily and just following these forms without the intention, without understanding what we're doing um, and not knowing any better, not being deliberate about it is really detrimental, right? So there's all kinds of 
<laughs> you know, just uh, I'm not, I'm not hearsay, but they're, they're very common uh, like platitudes where people say, you know, get them involved, right? Um, uh, how people, yeah, and it's, it's that the fact of the matter is that, you know, this is this is art, not science, right? It's, it's not, you know, follow this recipe, you'll have success. It, you know, we're creating something beautiful, right? That's just one of our pillars as fraternity. It requires that level of thought and meticulous care and crafting those relationships and having those relationships not just be cookie cutter, you know, you know, make this fit in this whole kind of stuff, you know, we have to have it kind of customized for each individual lodge and each individual person and building those relationships that way intentionally is how we get those strong bonds. Um, and it's when people are just treated like another, you know, body to fill a chair, that's when we have problems, right? When inspection is just what you do, right? Um, cause you have to do it, or this is what we do in inspections, right? This is the way we've always done it. That is one of the core problems that we see is that we've had these best practices that are poorly understood, poorly implemented, uh, and maybe not fit for use in the area that we're looking at them. That drives a lot of this function. We have. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree that, yeah, it's like, if, if you don't know why you're doing it, you're just doing it because what's the point? Um, I did want to um, say in Virginia, we have a warden certificate that you have to earn before you can be installed as master and typically you earned it as junior warden is we, we push people to do it. So that way you're a senior warden, you can relax and build, you know, plan your term, line up your speakers and all that stuff. But that's basically it. We do have ritual schools. Uh, we do have local district schools and most of us have their own school. We do have regional schools that are optional, but they encourage the officers to show up. But basically the local districts will say okay here's who we're going to put in the chairs and you basically can present all three degrees that's useful you're not being graded no one comes to your lodge and tests the overall lodge's ritual it's the guy who's going to be master has to be proficient in opening and closing the lodge conferring the degrees which is good but he can do that at his own pace i just got mine for the research lodge which was a short form version of it. But basically when you're junior warden, you go get your warning certificate and then you forget about it. You just, you're doing the work. You don't need, you don't get graded again. And the lodge as a whole doesn't get graded. So I, I can see where that's a lot of pressure with those inspections. If it's like make or break for the lodge, it's, I don't know. But every lodge, every grand lodge just does it a little bit differently. So, you know, you do what you do. We do what we do. It's a little different. <laughs> Um, I did wanted to say, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, please like and subscribe. Um, we just uploaded all the recent um, unstated meetings up to this point are all there on the um, on the YouTube channel. So if you're watching this, you're already on the uh, you're looking at the playlist. Uh, in two weeks, on the 24th, we're going to have Joe Martinez, who's a frequent flyer here. He's going to be giving a presentation. I just asked him today for what topic is, so I can make sure I can promote that. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank Taylor for being here. We're wrapping up just under an hour, so that's great. Um, I do appreciate it. It was a good topic. I think it kind of stimulates the thinking, and uh, we need to have more discussions about how to keep our lodges going and how to be more, if, make our lodges better and not just settle for the cookie cutter, I think. Just let's, what we, we're intelligent men. We should be thinking about what works and what doesn't work and try different things instead of just settling for, well, we always did it this way. Otherwise we grow stagnant. So thank you. Anybody have any comments for a wrap up? Okay. Thank you all for coming out today and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Everybody.